All right. G'day, everyone, and welcome to Malt with Mates. A uh, very special guest today. My guest today is Sam Simmons, head of whiskey at Adam Brands. Sam, how you doing, mate? Ah, uh, feeling special. Feeling like a guest on some whiskey bloke. How are you? I'm good. You know, I'm uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That came out weird. I am doing real. I am doing fine. It's just it's a, yeah, it's, a it's an overcast day, so I think that's just my brain's kind of going. A little bit fuzzy, but you know, I'm, once I get a whiskey in me, I'll be speaking of which. Sam, what are you drinking? Um, well, my buddy uh, brought over a, a ready-made um, Manhattan made with burnt ends that she left in my freezer, and so I've just taken it out. You can see the frost all over it, and so I'm going to pour myself. There's the frost. Oh God, frosty. I'm going to pour myself this ready-made Manhattan from Cat Spencer. Thank you, Cat. Look how cream. Look, at, I mean, it just comes out like butter. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start there. I know D Dave. Dave Worthington, boutique Dave, who is a friend and who I work closely with. He would say this is not the day for a Manhattan. Mondays for Manhattans. Nonetheless, here we are. Yeah, what think, about you? I think Friday. Friday can do we like? Uh, I just picked up a Westland, uh, Westland American oak today. I actually oh. I got the Peated cut the peated version and the oh, I've just broken that shit. Uh, I got the peated version and the sherry version. I should point out this show is not sponsored by Burn Ends or Westlands or the shop I picked it up from or by Duracell, but it's um, yeah, yeah. We went with the name Duracell Bunny, was a suggestion from uh Fiona Shoup, who said you have the energy of a du of the Duracell Bunny, and I thought oh, that's he perfect. That's Dave, okay. that's that's Sam in a nutshell. Like, uh, Fiona, it's an illusion. It's it's all it's all a performance. Life is but a performance. So maybe maybe I, I do feel lucky to uh, give that perception. And I'm if that's how it, that's how I'm seeing, that's fine. I'll take it. Duracell bunny. You guys, Fiona, watch whoever was sharing all these claw photos. That was that was hilarious. Well, cheers. Westland's great, beautiful distillery. Lovely guys, cheers. lovely people working there. Oh, it's a nice glass too. Cheers. Mm. Friday feeling. Friday feeling is good. I mean, it's it's funny you mentioned the um that those little video, those little pictures that people had where it was uh you know photoshopping all the different things into your hand. And later on, I might figure out how to share my screen and show the one that I think is the best winner. But it was it was down to two. Uh, there was Malt Whiston's Tyrannosaurus Sam, which was you photoshopped onto a T-Rex. That was fantastic. Yeah. And then there was a uh, Claire Vodkins uh, who had, I was seeing, whole, I've got the whole world in my hand. World. And yeah, that's how I like I that the world was keeping And I thought that was brilliant. Well, that's that's the image that started it all, wasn't it? That's I, I'm, I had to put something in my hand. <laughs> I, 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 when I worked with Balvenny, I mean, I have so many photographs over the years of me holding an invisible orb. I don't know. I guess I really talked with my hands when I was doing tastings, but I have so many images where it looks like I'm holding some invisible yeah, globe or, or planet or sandwich. Well, you do kind of look like a wizard. Maybe it's just that. I, I didn't always. I haven't always looked like a wizard. I just, sometimes just looked like uh, – before all this was gray, I just looked like a, a, a nerdy Star Trek and whiskey fan. Well, funnily enough, you mentioned when we were chatting, you mentioned you love Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh -oh. And I I did, I tried to find whiskeys involved with Star Trek. I actually found four. Apparently, I think it's Silver Screen Spirits has done a couple of bottlings of Star Trek inspired whiskey. So they've got Montgomery Scott, which is a I blended. Saw, I've seen that actually, yeah. yeah. There's James T. Kirk Bourbon. James T. Kirk Reserve, and then there's, I think it's called Thruster 10 or, or something. But uh, I couldn't really make anagrams of most of them, so unfortunately. Yeah. Anyway, I can't share my screen, but I can show my screen. That, was... that is a... 
That's our winner. Tyrannosaurus, Sam. Um, I really like that photo, but just, just for, you know, because we all love the World Whiskey Blend, and Dave uh, advertises it at every single opportunity. Um, on every single whiskey circus, I think every time I've spoken to Dave, he's had a bottle of World Whiskey somewhere. But this was Claire's. Nice, yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Dave's a believer. Two... Oh, Dave is definitely a believer. Um, to Claire and uh, Mott Winston, uh, you don't win anything. For this but you guys did a great job and you should take that satisfaction and that should be more than enough you know life is about doing a good job and you've done a great job so cheers cheers to both years well if you want i can i can try to send them something terrible like we could tr i could try to find the worst cask we have or um yeah. some whiskey we put into Buckfast, or it's chestnut oak or um maple syrup barrels i could send them a dram of something shockingly bad i mean you say that Malt Whitson has actually done a Buckfast uh, cast finch whiskey, which I, I tried it. It is good. There's actually a video of me doing a tasting of that. It it was really nice, but, you know, by all means, send them anything you like. Um, yeah, that'd, that'd work. So be in touch, you both, and I will, uh, I'll send you something surprising. I won't label it. You'll just have to put it into your mouth. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah. Okay. So it was too late, though. You know, by the time it came out, it was uh, there was nothing to do. No, no, no. We couldn't. We couldn't stop that. And it needs to happen. It's all gap. It needs to happen. Yeah, and you, you can edit yeah, it out afterwards, right? You can edit it out in post. Uh, I mean, my editor's currently doing her dissertation and is starting work soon, so she might be able to do it. I can try. I might just make it louder by accident, or I could just like keep that on. <laughs> I can't promise anything. I'm not really good at this. Um, anyway, so I got some questions here to walk you uh -oh. through. And the first thing I want to ask is, who is Sam Simmons and what do you do? Hello, uh, my name is Sam uh, Samuel James Elijah Simmons. I am from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I moved to Scotland in 2002, and that's where I caught the whiskey bug. Um, yeah, I worked with Oddbins. I worked with the Scotch Home Whiskey Society on the tasting panel, and then as an ambassador, I worked with Sukinder Singh and a little bit with Douglas Lang. Um, that was all the time trying to get a job, a tenure-track role at a university, which never came to be until um, one day Balveni, or William Grant more generally, came to me and said, hey, come for an interview. Um, and I ended up landing a role as the Balvenie Global, sorry, the Balvenie U.S. ambassador, the first ambassador in the U.S. Um, I had a blog called Doctor Whiskey. I, you know, ran this whiskey club in Edinburgh. I was really, I, I, like you, a nerd. You know, I loved loved whiskey. Was part of this amazing whiskey fabric of supportive and lovely people um, that still obviously exists and has grown, if anything. Uh, yeah, and. And then, yeah, so I, after a couple of years in New York, um, moved back to the UK as the global ambassador for Balvenie, which was a dream because obviously it meant then we were traveling the world getting to talk about whiskey, um, but also working closely with Brian Kinsman and with David Stewart, MBE, the uh, malt master who's now been at the company 50 something years, eight years probably now. Wow, which is crazy. Uh, we, I remember celebrating his 50th anniversary with the distillery um, some time ago. Anyway, so we did that uh, for some years, worked on the DCS compendium, learned a lot about um, blending, obviously, blending within within single malt, so within the product of one distillery, but also um, multiple products, multiple vintages, Ton 1401, Balvenie Signature, um, Grants, of course, Monkey Shoulder, um, but also stock management. We did this thing called the DCS compendium, which was this... Um, pretty high-end range of whiskeys, but it was stock that we had uh, kind of no use for. And what I mean is um, in the stock model of stuff, Dave, things that David hadn't used because they weren't necessarily representative of Balvenie. So one thing that any whiskey maker talks about is, uh, you know, how 
Strath Island should taste like Strath Island, Glenlivet should taste like Glenlivet. That doesn't mean every cask does. So that's that's the great thing about a company like Boutique or any independent bottler is they're able to snatch those up and bottle them. But Balvenie, these things fell outside, so we found a framework within which to be able to release those whiskeys, and we called the DCS Compendium. And that was a crazy education because I learned a lot about how to manage stock, how stock had been managed through one of the greatest stock managers of all time and master blenders, David Stewart. Um, and having to make sense of it myself is pretty useful. And then I was done traveling. I spoke to my buddies, Ben and Justin, who own um, Master of Malt, founded Master of Malt and uh, the company Adam Brands and Maverick Drinks and said, hey, I don't want to travel anymore. I came home. I came home and found a photo, a, a drawing my daughter had uh, drawn that didn't include me, you know, that, that cliche. Um, and it was like a knife in my ball sack. It was horrible. Um, and so I started calling around to friends and saying, Hey, help. I don't want to try. I don't want to be away anymore. Um, and then some, some, maybe almost a year later, uh, they invited me to work with Adam Brands as head of whiskey. So is that who I am? I don't know. It's definitely what I do. I am very lucky to that, that sort of what I am is what I do and who I am is what I do. I'm, I'm a whiskey nerd. I'm a musician. I'm a bold bearded Canadian. And I get to be that every day at work. It's really, it's, it's, it's a dream. Oh, that, that's awesome. I mean, I guess the biggest thing, I mean, there's so many questions in that, but the biggest thing is I want to, I know, I want to know is what was, you know, you said you had your kind of whiskey moment over in Scotland. Was it one whiskey that did it for you or was it just, you know, this, this huge, plethora of whiskeys that suddenly had available and you thought and you just fell in love with it that way well it's a, probably a mix and i'm sure you have a similar uh story but i i didn't know anything about whiskey when i moved to scotland in 2002 um scotch or whiskey in general whiskey whiskey in canada is generally something you would drink with ginger ale or a, a double you order a whiskey and ginger ale um, it's a Canadian club or Crown Royal or whatever it might be. You don't, you're not really discerning about which brand. It's just, it's a mixed drink. At least that's at least how it was before I moved to Scotland. And I played music as well, traveling across Canada and, and across the U.S. And after a gig, sometimes would someone would buy, hey, great gig, man. Here's a scotch. And I didn't know what to do with it. I would just, oh, cheers, thank you. And I would slam it. And sometimes it was beautiful. And sometimes it was ap it tasted like cancer going down my throat, you know, like Lafroy or it, I didn't know what the hell that was. Um, so it was no, it was certainly not appreciation. So then when I moved to Scotland, I really I wanted to get into it. I joined a hockey team, like a good Canadian, and I joined the uh, Edinburgh University Water of Life Society. And I went along there, and it was mostly men, it has to be said. And I note that because it changed over the time I was there. But the, the society was mostly men. Uh, there was one woman from Sweden, and Sweden we know is a notorious country for uh, alcohol consumption, but definitely whiskey connoisseurship. Um, and a small group of people who would meet fortnightly, and you know we all put in a fiver or like 10 pounds to join, so there was some money in the kitty, and then a fiver each tasting, and you taste five different whiskeys. It was a great way to get introduced to the category. Um, and I remember after that first tasting, I don't even remember what I tasted. It was probably a regional tasting because it was an early introduction to scotch for the, for the new members. Um, but I remember the, the clarity of thought I had after having five 25 mil serves and this feeling of floating home. Um, it, it was a drunk, it was a drunk feeling like no other. Um, and it was, it was sort of, uh, cushioned by this, um, I don't, we still do it, don't we? But this, this intellectual or this academic angle of, pursuing information let's find out about the distillery let's find out about the people who make it let's find out about which releases they've had in the past let's collect them that i got right into that and so i was already in the university setting when i would be at a library i would take out old books by neil gunn or uh, david Deches and 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 read about whiskey as a way to reward myself after a day of, of research um it became like an academic thing and then i would you know, bring friends. We hey, let's go this weekend. Let's go to Pit Lockery and we can visit Edward Dower and Pit Blair Ethel or whatever. I just got into it like, like every nerd from that because primarily the way it made me feel. I'm not going to lie that it was a special feeling. Um, I thought drinking whiskey and that there was always something new and cool to discover. How it was tied to taxation or to migration or to all of it. I farming, agriculture. I thought I just thought it was fucking cool and I still do. 
No, that's fine. That that's awesome. I mean, I know the Water of Life guys. Um, I worked with them a lot when I was working in Scotland, and I loved the just the sheer nerdiness around the society. And it was, what are we talking about today? Are we going to talk about this tiny little niche area of whiskey that's only found in this tiny town in this weird country? And we've just been talking about that for twelve hours. It's like, that is so cool. I want in on this. I love that stuff. That's, that's you know, like because whiskey nerds i feel like of all the whiskey fans you know you have your collectors and your flippers what fans prefer. but then you got your whiskey nerds and i love talking to whiskey nerds i think i think that's that's absolutely amazing um Actually, I completely forgot what I was going to say there. Uh, well, you were, talking, you were talking about the society and that, that they, they do it for the right reasons. And I totally agree. And I have to be a bit vain here. And I, I do take some responsibility for that in Edinburgh. When I started joining this club, it was a bit poncy. It was all male. And it was a bit like older is better and sherry casks are better and this kind of crap. Um, when I was there, my wife, my wife to be and I, we met through the society, but my best buddy ran and Simeon, we, we had this uh, society that, grew from 12 people a meeting to two bottles worth, you know, 56 people. Um, each each meeting, it was at capacity, and it was all about the appreciation of the of the beauty of whiskey. It was never about, oh, this is better than that, or, oh, that one's, that's only a Glenfiddich. We don't drink Glenfiddich. It was always the joy of what story does it tell us? Where does it take us in our memory? What does it do for us as a community? We're, we, we, you know, we're, we were a, a, a group of 56 dear friends and we still are in touch. We bought casks from Aaron and Bricladi together. It's, a, it's, it's, it's my life. It's our community. And that's, that's the beauty of whiskey is that the Scottish drink has been bringing people together for five on, over 500 years. And that's what it's about. It's not about how much shit you can put in your cellar and how much money you can spend on the on, on whatever you're into. It's 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 about sharing and enjoying, as John Glazer says. No, that's fair. I agree with that completely. I mean, have you gone since you've become head of whiskey at Adam Brands, have you gone back to the Water Alert Society? Have you like contacted them or done a tasting form? How how does it feel to be going back as a I helped start this and now I'm now I'm showing your whiskey? What's that like? Yeah, so it is, yeah, I mean, I, like I said a second ago, I'm not embarrassed about being proud of things. And, you know, in my, in my whiskey life, that is one of the things I'm most proud of is being not, 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 not founding it or making it what it was, but being a part of that thing with Simeon, with Ran, with all the people from all over the world. And that, that was another cool thing is you're in a university setting in a beautiful cosmopolitan city like Edinburgh. And you have people from all over the world. Uh, attending these tastings so it truly is a global community and you know we ended up all having tentacles around the world because of it. we have friends in india we have friends in tasmania we have friends in toronto where i'm from but you know we have people everywhere and all through this bond that that whiskey gave us we have so many I, like i said i met my wife through it um i think when during our tenure there eight other people met life partners through the society it, i mean that's that's something special i think um so yeah, going going back there, it was really I, I did it with Balvenie a couple times. I've always kept in touch with the guys uh, and girl. I say guys generically. I apologize if that offends anyone. Um, but the yeah, we went uh, right before lockdown. I was up at the University of Edinburgh Univ University Water of Life Society, and if that's the last live tasting I ever do because of COVID, I will be very proud. It's a great it's a great bookend because that it, after that that week is when things locked down. I landed at Heathrow and then had to come home, and that was it. Um, uh, so that that was the last sort of beautiful in that way, poetic somehow. But anyway, it was it was amazing. The room was full. It was still fifty six people, two bottles worth. <clears throat> um, well, two real bottles, not boutique bottles, proper seventy cls. <laughs> um, uh, worth and, and the enthusiasm was all in the right places like there was a group of people who were super into nosing and tasting and taking notes there were other people who were all about being together in the camaraderie there are people who were asking questions and the inquisitive minds and there was that's exactly how it should be you know a nice a nice mix in a safe environment to pronounce Bunahaven wrong you know that that's that's what whiskey's about not not exclusion inclusion so uh what were you asking me? What's it like going back there? It's a dream. It's really, it's really cool. And Edinburgh is, it's so stupid, but um, having spent time there and formative years of mine there, 
when I, anywhere I am in the world, when I hear a Scottish accent, I always feel like, oh, hey, I'm from Scotland. And I always like go introduce myself to them, like as if, you know what I mean? It's so stupid. But I, I have that sort of hometown feel about Edinburgh and um, that smell when, you, when you're taking the bus in from the airport and the, the people and the buildings and everything about it. It's, uh, there is an there is emotional heartland there for me. No, no, I have the same thing because Edinburgh was the first place I lived when I moved to the UK. And I tell my partner this story all the time and she says it's a stupid story. But like, because I'm from Australia and, you know, like we, we don't have a lot of old buildings or castles or anything. And so, and that was the, like, and me, me moving. You have old pubs. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we have some old pubs. We have some pubs that are like 200 years old. And that's it. So me heading to the UK to move to the UK, that was my first experience of any like building that was older than a couple hundred years. And 20, it's a 24 hour flight from Melbourne to Edinburgh. And I remember getting the bus from the airport into Edinburgh and my, like my sleep deprived brain was staring at this wall that you go past like this farm wall. And all I could think was, I wonder how long that wall's been there. I wonder how old that is. That, that wall could be older than like white colonization of my country. And I was like, and then like a year later, I thought about it. I was like, that's, that was a really weird thought to have, but it does have that quality. If you get in there and you, you get off the bus and you're like, this is Edinburgh. And you know, I love, I love that place. That's probably my favorite city in the world. And plus the bars are fantastic. Like yeah. no one can deny it. It's awesome. Um, well, that, that's an interesting observation though. Cause I think that the measurement of time obviously is, as we're all in a rush now. We all have information at our fingertips. It was some poor bastard's life work to build that wall. Hmm. Right? I mean, that, that's something they would have done a little bit every day to build a perimeter for their property. Or some tenant farmer had to do it for the landowner. But either way, someone – that was just I, – I think, I think that is something that um, really puts our whole existence into perspective when you land, in a, especially when you're coming from the new world or the colonies – um, getting out into the old world or China or, or the UK or wherever it is, anywhere older than the pink parts of the map, um, that, that you do you do realize uh, that. And that's something we celebrate every day when we drink whiskey, that, that passage of time, I think. And that, that's, that's something that makes us all feel modest, I hope. No, I think you're definitely right there. And I guess that's – I'm not big into whiskey collecting. I think if you buy a bottle of whiskey, you should be either – opening it or saving it for an occasion where you open it. But I do love seeing those historical whiskeys because that is an opportunity to see, you know, how many people, when you consider this one bottle was the product of someone at a distillery, multiple people at a distillery. It was a product of wood. It was the product of barley. But for farmers, you had laborers going into it. And when you consider, you know, the amount of time, effort, and history that's gone into that one bottle, it really is striking and those bottles live on and you know especially with some of the older ones we'll never you might not know who distilled them who matured them who was head of that time the names are gone but the whiskey remains i think it's you know that's in our own way that's a little mark we leave and that is curiously that's a mark that you will leave because you are as head of whiskey you are constantly creating yeah, well, all that all that needs to happen is someone needs to buy some of those bottles. Otherwise, it's going to be lost forever. Some poor bastard's got to fork over their hard-earned money and buy that shit. No, you mentioned World Whiskey Blend, and Dave Dave's a big supporter, but we just got another order of it. I'm 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 shocked how well that's doing. Things like that. It's it's that is humbling. It's amazing. A drink that I like to drink. I we were criticized recently um, online by someone um, that the whiskey was too drinkable. Um, I think that's okay. I think that's the member. That's the point. It's not, you're not supposed to put it in a Glen Karen glass and write a blog post about it. We make whiskeys at boutique, at Adam brands, at air light, Lindsay, darkness, green Isle, all of it's to be consumed. That's what it's for. I mean, you say that, that actually could have been me that wrote that review. So thanks um, very much. <laughs> look, it's in my notes. I, it's one of the things I wanted to bring up. No, I think but like, I, I think that's great. I think that's what a whiskey should aspire to be. A whiskey should be drink. Whiskey should be something that you want to open it. I guess, I mean, talking about you 
you know, it's received such huge critical acclaim. Everyone wants it. Do you suppose that comes from the fact that people are now noticing that more than Scotland and America, Ireland, Canada, more more countries are releasing whiskey and people are excited to try something where they can go, this is literally, this contains whiskey from, is it seven countries? What? Oh, no, 11 more, countries? More, more or less could blend be more than that. I can't even fucking remember. I'll, I'll need to look at the document that my friend Jen and marketing made. But no, it, it's it's... Yeah, I mean, Australia, Taiwan, Switzerland, Germany, France, UK, the three countries in the UK, Canada, US, I'm sure I'm missing something. But yes, it's plenty. But no, the point, the point of a whiskey like that is to remind a boutique drinker, and this is someone who spends 50 pounds or more on a 50 CL bottle of something that can never be repeated, puts it in a Glencairn glass and writes a review on their blog, reminding people that this is, this is great. It's great to have something special. It's great to have something that demands focus and attention and respect. But remember, most of the whiskey around the world, the only reason these things are possible, these one-offs are possible, is because most whiskey is drunk hey, over rocks in volume, mixed. That's how, it's, that's how it's consumed. So what if we could bring people who drink it like that to the boutique world at the same time telling people who are already in the boutique world it's okay to put it with ginger ale it's no stress don't don't feel you're, you're ruining the whiskey the people who are involved in world whiskey blend are proud all the distillers are proud to be part of something that is reminding drinkers that um it's it is just a drink you might as well drink to to the the best you can i suppose in terms of quality there's quality craft distilleries all through the whiskey and at the end of the day it's going to go in your gullet anyway don't don't stress about it you had a question. I, like there, yeah. um, I mean, I quite like that. And we've had, I have a, um, Jesus, how do I go up on this? Okay. I have a regular on here, a regular viewer, um, uh, Gascony Nick, who is fantastic and always has the best questions. And talking about creativity and what you've created, they want to know what is the best whiskey idea you have had that everyone else thinks is crazy but you've been right well i gotta be careful because it, it, it might have cost some friends their jobs um i I, th I think i'm not ashamed to be a proud canadian and you know the world whiskey blend we were just speaking about the the core of the world whiskey blend is uh six-year-old canadian corn whiskey um from uh, don livermore and the guys at hiram walker and don's been a big inspiration as a drinker and the whiskeys he's made but also as a friend to like help me hey i've got a cast that's soapy how do i how do i fix it i have an authorusk i think a 12 year old authorusk that's a, a bit off i want to get rid of that quality and he helps me or like a, there's a vatting problem you know he's just a wonderful support and a wonderful guide someone we wanted to work with um so that canadian bias comes across to we used the uh, maple syrup cast so octaves that held maple syrup and i don't know why these existed initially because when i started two years ago uh, ben Ellison had been involved and, and he was the, the brains behind everything, all the liquid that Adam Brands was producing. Um, and he had, for whatever reason, used some octaves for darkness, a product that we still have, but that we had back then. And then they were left over. Why don't we put some maple syrup in it? Who knows what it'll become? We took the maple syrup out after I started and it was very yummy. And so we used that for some customers and shared it with people as gifts and whatnot. Um, and then the casts were sitting in Edinburgh and there was some, there were remnants, there are always remnants on the bottling, excuse me, in the bottling hall uh, that don't get used for, for various reasons. So you might have a small jerry can of 26 liters of something, five liters of something, even more if you only sold a certain amount of a cast, sometimes for, you lose uh, liquid. And, and so some of this stuff I found in Edinburgh was a 26 year old Highland Park and you know 26 year old highland park commands a pretty decent price so why would you ruin it by putting it into a cast type that will no longer let it be called highland park or scotch whiskey you fucking idiot well we did it 
Um, we put uh, 64 liters into a maple syrup octave uh, for I think nine months. That's the result. Uh, we haven't done anything with it yet. We are going to, I hope, although we won't be able to call it Scotch whiskey, we won't be able to call it Highland Park. So we're trying to find a creative way to do that. The important thing is, uh, holy crap, it's delicious. It tastes, it doesn't taste like a liqueur. It doesn't taste, you know, artificially sweet. It has a beautiful texture and it tastes like Highland Park. It's a great all rounder, a great mature Highland Park. So yeah, it was, it was a stupid idea. All right. It was stock, um, that we basically spoiled the value of cause we could have sold it for 700 pounds as a boutique. Um, but we already had a 26 year old Highland Park boutique out there. So I thought let's put it into maple syrup. And if I can, I'm going to blame Richard Patterson and Bill Lumpson because I was, I was, uh, at the IWSC judging, uh, two years ago, I think. And they were saying that the IWSC rules are going to change around what cast types we can use. And you remember probably a year and a half ago, maybe that that was announced that, yeah, there will be some changes. So here I thought, yeah, well, maple syrup, maybe it'll be wide open. Fucking idiot. They didn't mean maple syrup, of course. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I, if, if it was, if it did include maple syrup cast, we would be way ahead of the curve. But unfortunately, it didn't. But uh, that's probably the answer to uh, Nick's question. It, was, it is a crazy idea. I didn't tell everyone about it until it was too late. I mean, I think that's fantastic. I think I should point out, if you want to call it something, but you can't call it Highland Park, Highland Park is an anagram of high lad prank. So maybe you could call it that. Okay. We'll take it. What, what are you going to charge for that? Is there going to be any exchange? I'll send you a nasty sample as well. Send me a nasty sample. No, no. I, I just think there should be more anagrams in whiskey. I'm not doing a lot oh. at the moment. I just drink and I make anagrams. That's really all I'm doing. Um, but no, I, I love that. Uh, and just following on from that, are there any other wood types or previous fillings that you've either used or you want to use, but maybe you've been restricted by current laws or you've had pushback on? Is there anything that's really, you know, what, it, what Sam wants to do next? Oh, uh, probably should be careful. Uh, we ha I, I'm really lucky in, in my job that I am empowered by the company to make stupid decisions as long as I can clean them up afterwards. So this would be a Highland spark. Is that what it was nice? Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, Ireland for, is a good example of a country uh, of the old, old school whiskey countries, the classic five um, that is able to mature in wood. And that's yes. I think historically it's because of a bad translation. Um, but it's worked in their favor, hasn't it? Um, you can use chestnut, you can use cherry, you can use, yeah, any any other kind of wood you would like. Um, you could probably use a bunch of guitars pushed together. I don't know. So we uh, we are, look. I have looked at uh, chestnut because I've, I've drunk some Irish whiskeys that I think are delicious from chestnut oak, chestnut uh, wood, sorry. Um, we also, we did, you know, I hope it's okay to talk about this, Philip. But uh, Philippe Schreiberg, uh, the Rhythm and Booze project, uh, and Master Malt, they wanted to work on a, on something a bit different. And so we did, like you mentioned earlier, the Buckfast. We did a Buckfast uh, octave. And I agree with you. I think it tastes incredible. Of course, you can't call it Scotch whiskey. You can't call it the distillery name. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it's, there's going to be 64 liters in the whole world. So the amount of nerds who might watch this or who friends of mine or whoever – who will give a shit to try it, who cares if it can't say Highland Park, that's enough. It's not, we don't need to sell 10,000 bottles of it. Um, it's, it's a niche proposition anyway, and it tastes amazing. The Buckfast, the chestnut too. The chestnut gives a totally unique flavor profile. Um, we, you probably also like, I mean, Japanese, you know, um, Mizunaro oak, uh, that sandalwood thing, um, mm. some people love. I love it as a smell. Um, and I think that that, that might be interesting. I've never done that. Um, but also, I, I think the most important catalyst of flavor change, I'm not a scientist, the most important catalyst for flavor change in whiskey is actually oxygen. And, oh, that's a kid's toy under my foot. Um, and I would love to do more experimentation with that because there aren't a lot of regulations in the SWA regs 
about um, what you do between disgorging and bottling. So what if we could disgorge a cask and just leave it as a thin puddle, let it evaporate, mm -hmm. or, or surround it with chicken wings or um, people smoking marijuana or whatever, like make, surround it with something extreme, what would that do? And would it be illegal? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, there, there are some catch-all phrases in the SWA regs uh, to protect against doing anything non-traditional. Um, but if, if I, I think, I think I'd like to play more with oxygen. You know, I'm a big believer, and this is, this really does come directly from um, William Grant and Sons and David Stewart and Brian Kinsman in marrying, letting a whiskey rest before bottling, letting it, uh, first of all, get to know each other, but also be exposed to oxygen. Because again, oxygen is going to be a major catalyst for the chemical change inside the, uh, in the spirit. So of course you'll have losses. You'll, you'll lose uh, volume and alcohol, but you know, at home, probably if you left the glass of whiskey you're drinking now, if you left it overnight, when you come down tomorrow, it'll be a different beast. It yeah. may be worse. It may be better, but um, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely different. And, it, and not anything like if you just added water now, you know? So if you control that experiment, which I have done because I'm a fucking nerd, um, it's not the same. And so I, I would like to do more with, with air. But no, I think I within really like, I think that's scotch, tough. that's tough. All right. But I think that's really interesting. I mean, I pretty much everyone who watches, this is a, this is a kind of niche channel. Anyone who's watching this is going to know the basic regulations, but... When you're talking about, um, you know, letting something rest, if you were to keep it in, in a stainless steel vat by SWA regulations, you know, what's the, would, would, you, would that vat have to be enclosed? Would it have to have a closed top? Or would you allow, would you, no, so you could potentially do something there. Could you have maybe a wire frame over the whiskey and potentially there's something on the wire frame that could somehow. Because I, I think, think the problem, the really problem, cool. the problem, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just saying, I think what you're talking about is cool. The, pro the problem comes though when you intentionally do something to affect the flavor. And so that, that, that's, if you intentionally put that submarine sandwich from Subway, the tuna sub on top of the mesh, that's where the SWA would have an issue. If it happened to be there, I think it, they, they, they can't really take an issue. And I, I should say to you, um, every, well, definitely Green Isle, but all the blend and definitely world whiskey blend, we let them rest. I think it's a massive part of the congealing of flavors that, that happens with time. So I, we tasted it as soon as they've added it. And you know, if you do it at home, if you mix whiskeys together yourself, always I'd recommend it to anyone watching, um, keep, keep some in a little bottle, put it aside. And then the flash blending is a different beast. It's not the same. You need, you need to let it rest to see what that whiskey really is because um, it's, it's volatile as hell when you first blended it. Um, so letting it rest, yeah, for as long as you can afford is, is always recommended. And I think that's one of the big reasons that Green Isle is so um, mellow is because of the time we let it rest and naturally reduce in strength. I mean, your whiskeys uh, that you do like Darkest and Green Isle, when you're blending them together, I, I imagine you'll blend one day of the week and then you'll leave them for a day, two days, maybe a week, maybe more. So are you constantly trying samples that you would have made, that you would have blended uh, a week or more ago just to see what the optimum blend would be? Well, so you mean like when we're trying to recipe, when we're creating a new recipe? Yeah. 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 So dark, the, the thing with darkness is I, I take zero credit really for darkness. Darkness is what it is. It's a eight year old space side whiskey from a distillery that has worm tubs and partial three time distillation traditionally put it at eight years old from refill oil hoggies and bourbon barrels put into Oloroso octaves. And then we take, as many Oloroso octaves as we want after six or nine months, marry them together, put it in glass. Uh, that's the end of it. That's, that's, that's the distiller. Our supplier is what, who made that whiskey. We just decided what to do with it. Um, but the blend, so world whiskey blend, I think we did 
uh, let, let's, let's just choose a round number like 20, 20 different recipes as we were just discussing uh, plans with suppliers, who was going to be a part of it, who wanted to be talked about, who didn't want to be talked about as part of the blend, um, which we wanted to respect and honor their wishes as well. Um, and also does it work in the different mixing formats? So I was testing all the time across like 200 variables. Um, and that was wicked fun. And it was, it was done exactly as you say. So the, the one thing I would do is if we had different, everything would be dated um, mm-hmm. and each of the uh, vats numbered and, and then dated when they were married. And then whatever, whenever I was tasting or testing with coconut water or whatever the mixer I was testing that particular day, I would um, make a fresh batch of the same recipe. So we would have the fresh, freshly mixed uh, world whiskey blend alongside the, the one that's been sitting for a month. See what I mean? So I just just to see if there was a behavioral difference in coconut water or ginger ale, and almost always there was. No, I love that. I think that's really important because you're you're quality testing in a way. You're making sure that the, you've got the best product you have to put out at that time, and I think that's that's a huge thing for the purpose. So I get uh, is it? Look, I'm not going to lie to you. I, and Dave hates when I say this. But World Whiskey Blend is not a whiskey that I will put ever, myself personally, in a, in a Glen Cairn glass and mull over when I'm watching a serious film or you know, <laughs> reading a book. It's not that kind of whiskey for me. It's, it's uh, friends have just come over. We're, some people are having gin and tonics. Others are having whiskey and tonics. That's what we're pouring. That's what it's for. So it, it's fit for purpose. Green Isle is for that session whiskey that you just want to get to the bottom of the bottle. All that whole series, Aerolite Lindsay, uh, gray seal, even at 25 and 33 year old whiskeys, if you can afford it, they are all married marriages of casks to be consumed at volume. They're not to have one and sit, not heavily sherried. They're session whiskeys. Um, so they're all the, all these things are fit for purpose. That's that's the only thing you can hope for is that you aim for when you would like to drink it yourself first and foremost. But when you think people would would best enjoy the spirit, try to make it fit for that purpose as best as possible. Not necessarily try to make the best whiskey, whatever the fuck that is. You're trying to make something that is spot on when you want that high strength sherry kick. Darkness eight year old is exactly what that does for me. So I like that. I think it's it's a good answer though. Um and I guess one thing I've always wanted about the World Whiskey Blend, I'm sorry to keep on that. How did you decide on we don't, the- we don't We don't mind you keeping on that because we've just released the whole World Series. So we're really pushing World Whiskey. <laughs> we're all right, all right. right. Um, okay, other questions for World Whiskey Blend. How did you decide on the on those countries? You know, so you've, you've got, yeah, you've got Australia, uh England, Italy, I forgot Scotland. Italy. That's, yeah, I forgot Italy. Italy. So how did you decide to use, uh, you know, whiskey from Italy, Australia, all these places? Was this people who who said yes, they would sell to you? Or was this literally like, let's just blend everything we have in the warehouse in various different, you know, combinations and see what's best? <laughs> oh, fuck. The latter, my colleagues would have preferred for sure. Um, but that's not what we did. We, we might we might do. We're looking at doing it. Uh, so my colleague, who's the head buyer, Toby, uh, Toby Cutler, we were recently, well, recently, an hour ago, talking, uh, going through our bottled inventory and finding stuff that we had in bottle. We have twelve bottles left of this, nine bottles left of that. We did do a boutique sale recently to try and clear some of that stock. But we also have like jerry cans in the warehouse of thirteen liters or five liters. What the fuck are we gonna do with that? We should try to blind, don't even taste it. Just dump them together and like call it a, um, what do they call it when I just, uh, fucking hell, what's the phrase? Oh, like cast, cast Hail line. Mary. The Hail Mary. Oh, no, no, the, the Hail Mary. We just, you just throw it hoping that it, it works oh, out. I was right. thinking of fishing. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was two-handed. Come on. I, you, did, you did that much. I did. I did. You're right. I know. I, well, obviously, I'm not much of a sportsman. Um, but yeah, in, in any event, um, <laughs> We do have a lot of whiskey and remnants, I suppose, sat around. It'd be cool to come up with an idea of what to do with that. World Whiskey Blend wasn't that. World Whiskey Blend was trying to make, uh, inspired by uh, Dave Broom's book, The Whiskey Manual, where I thought it was fucking groundbreaking that he didn't review the whiskeys in a Glencairn glass or a cup of a glass. 
He reviewed the whiskeys, how they mix. Lagavulin 16, everything with the way the world drinks whiskey. Coke, ginger ale, uh, sparkling water, soda water, uh, coconut water, green tea, and tonic. Yeah. And, actually, no, he didn't include tonic, did he? No, I, no there was, I, yeah. I don't think there was tonic. There was green tea, no. but no tonic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so anyway, so you know, testing it the way the world drinks whiskey. I thought that was groundbreaking. So I, I, that, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a whiskey that fit with that. So the first thing is you need to find whiskeys that might jive with those flavors. So we mentioned Italy. Italy, I forgot earlier when I was uh, saying the distilleries. Puni is isoamyl acetate, that banana, that synthetic banana taste. I think Puni has that at large. And that is a key. Sorry, I ate the cherry and it's sticking in my throat. That's the, um, that's the key flavor that mixes well with Coca-Cola. So why does Jack why does Jack Daniels go so well with Coke? It's because of that banana, that banana flavor chemically, um, I think anyway. Um, and Coke was the hardest one to find a mix for. So to to find to make a whiskey that went well with soda, that was that's relatively easy as long as it's a nice balanced yeah. whiskey with bright vanilla notes. It's going to taste good. Um, g- a green tea, yet her- herbaceousness helps. Uh, dry fruits is the enemy. These types of things we learned. I just learned by experimenting. Um, so anyway, the whiskeys. To answer your question, without using as many words as I tend to be using as I answer these questions, is um, that we. I sought out whiskeys that we knew would mix well flavor-wise, um, and also a little bit of that um, self-aggrandizing vision of you know, the Johnny Walkers uh, of Scotland saved and 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 made sure that the 21st century could see Cardew, could see Klein Leash. You know, remember, it's important, I think, to remember that in the 1880s, these distilleries I just mentioned, for example, were seen as gut rot, inconsistent, the same way we see craft whiskeys today, a lot of people. A lot of people say, oh, that's fucking suspenders and beards, bimber, fuck bimber. It's, it's young, it's immature, it's inconsistent. Um, these types of things. Well, that may, maybe that's true, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Thank you very much. It is if you're trying to be a, a brandy and soda drinker in the clubs of London, which most people were who were consuming that stuff at the time. So blends were there to get in the glasses of the middle classes. But because they use Cardew and Klein Leash and Kalila, these distilleries have survived. Otherwise, they maybe maybe wouldn't have. So that I mean, I have to be honest. That's part of, that's part of it too. I think Millstone, uh, the Zuidam Distillery, I think what Patrick and his family do, I think those are some of the best whiskeys in the in the world. Um, and I don't think they're in any commercial uh, trouble. But I want to make sure that they're a part of the of the World Whiskey Blend, for example. Um, Arthur Nagla, uh, awesome uh, guy, German, uh, influential. Uh, whiskey enthusiast who's who's informed many of the European distilleries, including Puni, including many of the German distilleries, uh, using some of the distilleries he's worked with is something else I wanted to do because they're on the right track. They're making great spirit and it will fit well with the, the purpose of this particular whiskey, which was mixing. Um, so that's, that's where it went. That's really where it came from. And then, and then maybe you're right a little bit of friends. So I, I love uh, the guys at Copperworks in the U S for example, um, so we included them, um, Amaric, uh, in France, the Warringham distillery. So things like that, a, a little bit were, were, were personal, but it was mostly about, uh, it was flavor first. And then this idea of, well, how could we need to make sure that, uh, craft distilleries that we love and just all distilleries that we love can, um, get into more mouths and the more people become aware of them. Well, I mean. Following on from that, I guess the big question is what what are the top three countries and or distilleries that Dr. Whiskey looks forward to? Like what's what's on your radar where you're like, I'm so excited for these guys for both a drinking as a single malt purpose and also for a blending purpose. Who are you excited for? I'm excited for all of us because we get to drink the stuff. I mean, remember 10 years ago, you, <laughs> 10 years ago, you'd be at a whiskey show uh, as an ambassador or as a, cost, a consumer on that side of the stand. And you would hear people, enthusiasts, not casual drinkers, enthusiasts say, oh, Japan, 
brands making scotch now? I don't think you hear that anymore, certainly not with enthusiasts. Um, you might still hear it uh, among novices, and that's fine, because it, it's a confusing category, and it's hard, you know, most people still don't know the difference between Jack Daniels and Johnny Walker, which is totally fine. Um, but it, with, amongst connoisseurs, I think we are way more accepting that the rest of the world is making single malts than we ever have been. I think for a long time, there was a lot of stuffiness from the institutions, from the distillers, the big distillers themselves in Scotland. And as Dave Broom, uh, I think, wrote today in a review of our whiskeys and uh, a, a whiskey from Lakes Distillery and a couple from Australia, Native Grain, I think Adelaide, Adelaide Native Grain, I think um, Dave Broom said something like, Scotland should pay attention. Yeah. Because I got my, my uh, I mentioned Toby Cutler, who's our head buyer. His team includes Felix, um, it's Felix Deer. And Felix has bought. Uh, I guess I can talk about this, a bunch of uh, Australian whiskey for us that we're going to bottle in the, right at the beginning of uh, next year. Um, and when he brought the samples into the lab, uh, I, the day before, I had been tasting 22-year-old Mortlock, 29-year-old unnameable Klein Leash, uh, Old Pultney, 30-year-old Old Pultney, and, like gorgeous whiskeys. And he brought these in the day after. We nosed them, and I – Hand on heart, these were some of the best whiskeys I had tried that week. You know, the, they compete. Some of these whiskeys competed with thirty-year-old old Pultney. Like that's fucking crazy. Two-year-old Belgrove. You know, I am a huge like not just as not just because I'm Australian and I'm being patriotic, but I honestly think Australian whiskey is one of the most exciting areas of the world. You're talking about a country that has over 300 distilleries yeah sure it is for the most part it's just guys making whiskey in sheds they'll do a couple of hundred bottles a year you know our biggest distillery i think is hellier's road they might have a capacity of like a hundred thousand liters but there's so much variation and because the laws are so lax and because we've got such wood and such variation from you see such a thing i've got i've got this is a this is an ovarine port cask this is a lime burner right. sherry wood Oh. And these two whiskies, they were my last two reviews on my blog, somewhiskeybloke.com. You can go and read it if you want. You know, they, I would much rather spend my money on those and have something that is really interesting than spend my money on, as you say, the 30 year old old Pulteney. I'd much rather spend my money on that than I would on a Dalmore or a McAllen or a Middleton because. I know what I'm going to get from all those companies and it's going to be good. Yes, but it's going to be safe. And I'm paying, I feel like most of the time I'm paying for the name on the bottle, I'm not paying for the whiskey inside it, but with the Australian ones, Oh my God, I'm, I'm so excited. I, I just, I heard the other day, I got a press release the other day from a distillery in Tasmania that I need to post shit. Um, but they were talking about their whiskey. They have they've got forty bottles in their first batch. They'll be doing a second batch soon that'll have more, like a hundred bottles. And this guy just started making it because his wife said to him, he made a bet with his wife, you uh, if I can make you a gin you love, you will allow me to make whiskey. And she said yes. And he, he made her a gin she loves, so he gets to make whiskey. And I just love that kind of entrepreneurship, that that inventive, that creativity. And he was talking about how, you know, like Damien Mackey from Mackey Distilleries has started up a single pot still distillery, which I imagine he's going to get into all sorts of trouble over because apparently that's, an, uh, that's a GI. But you can do anything, and you've got guys who are doing anything and doing everything and just want to make whiskey. I think that's such an interesting thing to do. And if Australia had the capacity of distillation it used to have, we're talking like 100 years ago, it yeah. would be so. It would be on everyone's radar, but it doesn't have that, and it just it just gets overlooked, which is disappointing. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, that, Sorry. no, 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 man. That, that I, I, I completely agree. My, my, my reservation about Australia only comes uh, to something you you touched on there, and it's about price. Um, most of the distillers of Scotland, and this is not a criticism, um, over the years have, for various reasons. Uh, had to adjust their economies of scale 
and to get prices down and to and to protect agriculture to make it easier for farmers to grow a successful crop and all these things and these are these are positive things overall um but what it's resulted in is a spirit cost of you know say three pounds three three pounds a liter of alcohol uh, whatever it is i i don't know i'm not a distiller but when you look at um Belgrove or you know pe people you've mentioned already um iniquity you know speaking of sheds you know um their their cost of spirit isn't fucking three pounds. There are six jobs related to it. There are grains that have to be brought in from a different place. They're malted on a small scale. Whatever the situation is, the cost of liquid is much higher. Now, of course, look that gets translated to the consumer. So we mentioned already the Adelaide the uh, native spirits. You know, a bottle a bottle of their single cast stuff is five hundred Australian. That's like two hundred fifty yeah. British pounds. That's, that is not cheap. You know, we could do an old Pulteney 30 year old for cheaper than that. That is not to say that they're competitors because they're not. Because exactly as you say, you want to take a risk and try something new and support some far out fucking crazy guy in Australia, you're going to spend 250 pounds. You want to have a drink that you can rely on and that you know will be safe to offer your guests. That's an Avalar 30 year old or an old Pulteney 30 year old. They're, they're different things. But the fact that the world is so, um, kaleidoscopic now with whiskey is fucking exciting i think we have we have so much to choose from and it's not at the cost it's not one instead of the other it's as well as i mean we're still i, I still buy balvenny double wood but i also buy 250 pound australian whiskey no i understand that i think that's that's awesome and i want to point out that if anyone is watching this live and anyone's watching the future poor bastards yeah it, well, yeah. No, Sam is completely correct. Australian whiskey is expensive, and that is something that everyone in the Australian whiskey industry will come out and will tell you it is expensive. But it's expensive because of tax, because of VAT, because because of so many things that are put on the distilleries. They're not choosing to sell it at that at that price. This is all down to the government, and hopefully, you know those those. Those taxes should be dropping, should be for, should be dropping a little bit soon. But if you do want a fantastic, affordable Australian whiskey, the Starwood Twofold has got to be one of the. Sorry, I know Sam, this, I know this one is about you, but the Starwood Twofold has got to be one of the best whiskeys I've had in a long time, especially within that price range. It's about sixty Australian. It's thirty-five pounds or something from the whiskey exchange. Buy yourself a bottle and really get to understand this is what Australian whiskey is hoping to be is this really easily priced, super good spirit. One day we're going to get there. Yeah, but I think it's, it's just a matter so of when the government fucking picks up. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not just govern the government though, man. It's, it's so important that we remember from the perspective of 2020 that whiskey, and this is Gavin D. Smith who wrote about this, and I've spoken with him about it, a great, great author, buy his books. Um, that whiskey in the 70s, whis whiskey, first of all, whiskey shouldn't be cheap. It has a massive ecological cost. Mm. It, is a, it is a luxury item. Not, I don't mean luxury like, oh, posh golf clubs. Blah, blah. It, there is so much that goes into the process. It is luxurious to be able to waste water and waste grain the way that we do in this in this traditional drink. So it is and trees and, and everything else. It, there is a huge ecological cost to whiskey. It should not be artificially cheap like corn. Okay, not corn whiskey, corn the food. Okay, that, that that's the one thing. And I think it's very important to remember that in 1970s. And again, this is Gavin D. Smith that that writes about this and has told me this this story. Uh, the average cost of a single malt scotch whiskey bottle was the average salary of a, a, a weekly wage of a, an average laborer. So if we're looking at, again, I'm going to speak about a native grain or Star Wars, not a great example. Um, Fleurier, or I, I don't know. There, there are probably some good Australian yeah. examples. New Kalara, if they have three-year-old whiskey yet, I'm not sure. But for, you know, the, whatever it is, those probably are, the cost of roughly a labor a, a, a week's work and that's okay because that's really what it costs to produce the drink that they're making because in their environment they don't have the economies of scale that uh, the big companies of scotland has in scotland scotland took 
250 years to become the machine that it is today. And we shouldn't, it's not a criticism. That's why it's so beautiful. That's why we can buy a 12 year old Linkwood and know it's going to be fucking delicious. That's okay. And it's not going to break the bank. That's, that's a blessing we should be grateful for rather than cursing. But it's important to remember with all the craft distillers around the world that their cost of production is more realistic to what the world, the, the, the cost, the ecological and, and economic cost is. No, but having uh, all of that completely agree with, and I just want to say we, we do support craft distillers. It's immensely important to support craft distillers and these new world distilleries so that one day Okay? No one's home. Yeah, no one, no, uh, no one's home. But I, the door just I heard that bump though. Like I heard a bump on my. This is, this is going to be that video that goes viral when the guy dies. Okay, so it's been really. I mean, nice if it does go viral, I might finally get sponsored. So that's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I, I no, don't dare do go work, out. There. We want to support. We want to support these craft distilleries and these new world distilleries. So in the end, they will cost the same amount that scotch costs now. Exactly. You could buy exactly. a 12 year old, um, uh, you could buy a 12 year old Belgian, French, German, Italian, Australian, uh, Taiwanese whiskey for the same cost you would spend on a 12 year old scotch. That will be, that's, that's the day I'm living to see. Um, I, we did have another question, by the way. This is quite. This is like about half an hour ago that he asked this question. But Nick, you know, because we've, I got worked up a bit, and I need to relax. You might need to relax because you're, you know, there could be a potential murder in your house. Yeah. So, Nick asked, relax. If you go to stay with a friend who is just getting into whiskey, what three bottles do you take? Oh God! Am I supposed to promote my own stuff or just be honest? Um, so look, you can do either. Uh, I tell you what, if you if you prom, if you prom, uh, say your honest feelings now, and then record a promotion of your own stuff, and I'll try to edit it over the top. <laughs> we don't need to talk about my own stuff. Let, let's just talk about the the world of whiskey. So some, uh, I'm going to assume this person would be averse to trying world whiskeys because they're new to whiskey. They're probably going to want scotch and um, you cannot, and I know I work for Balvenie, but you can't go wrong with Balvenie Doublewood. It's a staple on my shelf. It has been for years. You asked me what's the whiskey that got me into whiskey. I answered some convoluted thing about being the community and everything else, but really it was, it was Balvenie Doublewood. That was the first bottle I bought. Uh, Talisker would be the other one. Talisker 10 year old. Um, I probably didn't like it the first time I had it, but when I had it after I had tried 10 other whiskeys, I realized, holy shit, this is what it's about. And now I can say as a blender, not that we get Talisker offered. If, you, if you're if you at home, I recommend this anyway. If you have a whiskey that you're, eh, it's not not quite up my street, add a drop of Talisker and it, it fixes every drink. Mm. It's, a, it's a magical, magical whiskey. So yeah, it's above any double wood. I, I, I have nothing... No, I have no shame in saying how much I love Johnny Walker Black. Um, Green Isle is supposed to imitate that style or the way Johnny Black used to taste in the 60s. Um, and I think uh, someone new to whiskey might be afraid of that because it's smoky. So I probably wouldn't bring the, my normal recommendation, which is uh, my normal Desert Island Dram, which would be Johnny Black. So I think, yeah, so everyone who, who even if they don't like whiskey, of course they're going to love Balvenie Doublewood. It's sweet and it's beautiful. Um, another thing that shows them what whiskey's all about, and it was uh, has to be said, was sort of off form for maybe about five years, is Highland Park 12. Um, the, the, the normal Highland Park, I'm sure they have some Viking name for it now, but the, the, the regular 12-year-old Highland Park is a gateway whiskey for many. Many people got into whiskey through that, that I've met. Um, and it's a whiskey that I always have open on my shelf. I, maybe, I have to be honest, I probably didn't for about five years because I thought, it just wasn't up to snuff. And now it's back. It's at, a group, at an amazingly affordable price. Um, and most importantly, it's fucking delicious. 
Um, and then the other thing, I, I'd probably try to think of something that they wouldn't be embarrassed to mix. I mean, don't forget, you don't, if you're not into whiskey, drinking 40% or more spirit straight is unpleasant. It's not, <laughs> and the primary purpose of, I hope, of, of, of enjoying alcohol is pleasure. It's the pursuit of pleasure. So enjoy it. You want to put soda in it or ice in it or Coca-Cola? Great. So I'd probably go for something American. Obviously, I could, I could, at this point, I could say world whiskey blend, but I think, I think, um, uh, um, American whiskeys that are widely available, Maker's Mark, Buffalo Trace, uh, anything from Heaven Hill uh, is is going to tick a box for, for sipping. You can sip all the whiskeys I just mentioned, but it's also going to be great for mixing. And then if, if we had, if they were like, ah, no, nah, I don't drink bourbons, I would, instead of in that same place of the three, I would say monkey shoulder because you just, you can't go wrong. It mixes with everything. It's great neat. It's great on the rocks, a beautiful texture, full of bourbon. Uh, flavors and sort of uh, definitely distinct to the other bottle I brought over to this hyp hypothetical situation to their house. I brought double wood. Let's bring two William Grant's products. Why don't we? Yeah, I guess that's my answer off the cuff there, bud. No, oh, I think that's I think that's great answers, and I hope I hope Nick enjoys those too. Um, what would you bring? What's what's your one recommendation to a newbie? Baines. Oh shit. Yeah, great. Yeah, probably the best grain whiskey in the world right now. I, I just the Baines from a new whiskey drinker, and I I say this coming as someone who has I've been in whiskey for about ten years now. I've only just gotten to a point where I can actually afford better whiskeys so for someone who's just getting into whiskey i imagine they're probably early 20s and they might not you know they, they can't splurge a lot of money so baines is a great example of this whiskey will cost you 25 30 quid and you're going to get a great whiskey for it it's also a different style of whiskey so you can talk them through that and, and say this whiskey is fantastic on its own. It's great for mixing. It's a versatile whiskey. It's all in all, it's got to be one of the world's best whiskeys just in terms of price, versatility, taste. And it's from South Africa, which gives it a kind of, you know, it just makes it more fun, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's that's my number that's my number one. That's generally that's an why if, if I try I don't have a bottle on my shelf now um, because the uh, no one delivers to this current address. For it's a weird address, but yeah. there's I I normally always have a bottle of Baines on the shelf just because Baines Baines is amazing. Uh, yeah, you know I'm gonna send Andy. I'm gonna try and send Andy a bill for that, like an invoice, like say I've I've hyped you up. Can I please have a bottle? Uh, they, they, no, uh, I unfortunately, don't do they don't need it. They don't need it. They can barely keep up with demand. They're doing fantastically. And yeah, I totally, that's a great recommendation. Great whiskey. I would go for that. Um, so then you mentioned in there, you mentioned Johnny 12 quite often. So I think I might know the answer to the next question, but what is Sam's relaxation whiskey? Duracell bunny, Fiona, fuck's sake. You know, I, I do relax. Um, well, you, you probably something that you don't need to think about and that you can trust like an old friend. Balvenie Doublewood falls into that category for me. Johnny Walker Black falls into that category for me. A glass that isn't a, a Glencairn. I don't know if you've ever seen me. Uh, do I have a Glencairn here? try to use the Glen Cairn, but with the schnoz, it's, it's a real pain in the ass. And I know that's the industry standard, yep. but they're, they don't, they don't work well for me. I find them very uncomfortable to drink from too. Cause when you, when you turn it to sip, it hits my nose. So I, I actually can't get liquid out of the bottom unless it's filled to the top, which I don't think anyone does with the Glen Cairn. Um, and look, I have friends at Glen Cairn. I'm not sh shitting on the glass. A, there is a time and place for it. But anyway, so it'd be a drink that you don't need to be, worried about having um obviously 
in our house, we go through a lot of Green Isle now because it's sort of a session whiskey. It's an everyday whiskey. It's a Johnny Walker Black um, replacement, but it is more like White Horse where Johnny used to be in the 60s. Uh, 70s, uh, 70s White Horse, 60s Johnny Walker style. Um, so I, I like that kind of thing. I like an all-rounder. I've got Highland Park 12 back there, something that just ticks the boxes of what do I love about whiskey? I love I love the big maltiness, the fudge, fudgy character that malt gives. I love a bit of smoke. I love a bit of sweet. I love a bit of filth, you know, whether that's Craig Alecky or Fetter Cairn, I don't care. A bit of the filth is good. Um, and it's character, even a bit of sulfur. So yeah, I, I probably, I'm going to ask for Highland Park, I think for today, after that long preamble. I'll tell you what, I just, you mentioning filth in whiskey there, it just, it makes me think about, uh, when I was at the society and we did the, um, we would do the fill your own, you know, at the bar, you could, yeah, this is the vault. You walk up, there was a. 50 liter cask of like a it was like an export or an ex sherry or something and it was filled with something and you could fill up a 35 seal bottle and i was always when i was working there i was always the one who had to disgorge it so whenever there was not you know there was too little left to get it out of the tap i was the one who lugged it downstairs who turned it over and i poured everything residual stuff into a jug and I, I absolutely loved the filthy dregs when you would have a whiskey that, like, it's it's got texture literally because it's got little bits of wood <laughs> and, carbon, and the, filter, yeah. the filter's not stopped anything. And you would, you would give this whiskey. And I, I remember doing a tasting where I poured some of the whiskey and the whiskey was, it had a slight green tinge for some reason. And I was... And people were saying, just looking at this whiskey makes me feel a little bit sick. And I was like, hey, hey, try it, at least try it. And they tried, and they, and they did say, you know, it's the filthiest whiskey I've ever had, but it's really, really good. And I love a filthy whiskey. Like, I love something unfiltered, it, you know, just like, all the flavor. I just, I just want it straight from the cast, just like that. That's what I want. Yeah, oh, but I even shit like these, these distillery styles that are a bit impure or a bit a bit filthy they're so vital the fact that they even exist today is because blending wouldn't exist without them you can put a perfectly clean spirit strath mill or something and um some grain whiskey together it will be bland you need meaty kind of fucked up whiskey sulfury casts like that. remember when bunahaven maybe 10 years ago now changed their recipe of their standard 12 year old it's almost unanimously agreed that it's better. But uh, Ian always t spoke about the fact that what they were doing was they had a whole uh, stream, I guess, of spirit that was put into casts that were sulfury. So what are they going to do with this inventory? So just blend it in, and not, not in a massive rate, just a bit. Because like umami or like salt in a meal, a little bit goes a long way. And a little bit of that PD stock, a little bit of the sulfury stock in the Bonhaven 12 is just, I mean, that that's one of the great, that, that is another underrated hero in Scotch whiskey. I think that Bonhaven 12 year old is fucking beautiful and has a bit of the filth that you and I both like. Love the filth. So my, my second, my second last question to you before we move on to my favorite section, the quiz and anagram. Quiz is, and anagram. Uh, if you could have any bottle of whiskey from the past, present, or future, uh -oh. what would you take? Um, so the distilleries north of Inverness, you know, the, are, are interesting as drinks, but also just that area, the Duke of Sutherland, the clearances, um, the cairns, you can see the, the old, old, old homes and, and uh, places where people used to live and settlements and crop farmers and the, the abrupt cliffs. That part of Scotland is fucking cool to me for all, for whiskey reasons, uh, balanced with historical reasons. And also being from the colonies like you are, a lot of people moved to Australia where they were forced off the land, moved to Australia or to, um, to Canada. So there's some cool connection to that part of the Scotland. 
I love Klein Leash. I love Brora, but um, I like sort of old, old, old Klein Leash before there was such a thing as Brora is sexy as anything. And uh, I can't afford those whiskeys anymore. There was a time that I had friends who did have some of those bottles open. I visited Angus. Uh, that trip I spoke about when we went to uh, Edinburgh, I visited the Whiskey Sponge, and he has some cool old bottles open. So you could try old Klein Leash. But I, I'd say that old Ainsley and Habram Klein Leash, there's one that has like a uh, orange and yellow label. Just I think it's 12 years old, just sort of standard. I mean, at the time, it was probably extra old Highland whiskey. But that's one of those whiskeys that I've tasted and feel like I'm always chasing that flavor again. Um, a massive, massive maturity and fruitiness at just 12 years. And, uh, and now I don't know what those bottles are, but they're, they're way out of reach. So I'd, I'd probably say yeah, an old Klein Leash 12 year old Ainsley and Hamer. I'm trying to find a picture actually over here, although I won't be able to show you. So that was stupid, but yeah, exactly. It's the orange and, and sort of red label. If you look you, up Ainsley you Hamer, might be, you might be able to, I think, I think you can share your screen. Maybe. I don't know how this works. You don't I've want used that this thing happen. for about four months. I have no idea how this how this platform works. <laughs> yeah, I'm scared it's going to show something dodgy. Give it a try. I said I just got a friendly friendly heads up warning. Do I have to do something? Hold up. That's just. I think I got it. No. Oh, you've got it. Oh, Can you God. see that? Just... Oh, God. That was just me. Well, welcome to Dr. Whiskey's Some uh, Whiskey Book episode. I'm uh, honored to have been taking this episode over. And I hope that you also. Oh, man. We'll ignore that I did that. Can you see what I'm sharing? I cannot see what you're sharing at all. I have no idea what you're sharing. It says StreamYard is sharing your screen. I don't know what screen. Oh, here we go. Here anyway. we go. Yeah, there you did it. Yeah. There we go. So that. Sukinder so saying oh, I, I used like to work, that. I used to work at the whiskey exchange and Sukinder so was and still is very generous in all sorts of ways. Um, but he was always about opening bottles and we we opened a few of these together and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities he gave me and the flavors he exposed me to. Old Hague's, he had these gorgeous old Hague bottles from before the war. Anyway, old Klein Leash. That's that's my answer. That was a great answer. Um I want to add that uh, Shilton Almeida as, uh, is crying a little bit over our last interaction there. Um, well, I think that's fantastic. Um, you, you spoke about the whiskey sponge, Angus, because I've met Angus a few times, and I do love Angus because he's a whiskey nerd as well, and he just wants to hear what other people think of whiskey. So he does. He is... You know, he's the guy who comes in with a bottle of 12-year-old Lagavulin that was bottled for the Italian market in 1981, and there's only 5,000 bottles of it. And he's like, here, tell me what you think of this. And it's like, this is, yeah, it's, it's nice. What else do you want to know? It's like, I just want you to tell me if it's good or bad. What do you think? I love that. I love that about whiskey drinkers. Um, now, I do want to apologize to uh, to him now, because uh, Gaskin and Nick just put up a question. And then I managed to navigate away from this page and then come back. So the question is here, but I think I can remember it. Uh, the final audience question of the night, what whiskey of yours uh, on your shelves had heels in it because you, you didn't want to drink it? You refused to drink it for so long. Uh. Where is it? Oh, I maybe did give up. Oh no, maybe I I might have kept the bottom in here, but anyway. One would be oh, can you hear me? Yep. 
can go. Yeah, we cool. got you. Um, Springbank's uh, Hazelburn. I think their first release, eight-year-old. There's three different labels. There's the maltings, the stills, and the washbacks. Um, I think that's it's an eight-year-old whiskey, and I think drinking it, you have no idea. It properly tastes from a different era. Um, it's beautiful and rich, and I was fortunate enough. I couldn't, I didn't get any in, in the UK because they were all sold out some years ago. But I found two in Norway at the Vin Monopole and bought them, and I've drunk them both. But I kept, I kept one remnants in a little bottle over there that I, I can't let go of because just. I I actually knows it as a reference for the kind of farmy, filthy style of whiskey we were talking about. That's beautiful and rich and deep, and doesn't need to be thirty years old. You know, it's eight years old. It's 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 gorgeous whiskey. The other one is um, any of these, but this is a ton fourteen oh one, batch nine. When these get when these get low, I I just leave them and I get too much air on them and probably ruin them because I I don't want it to end because I know. With all due respect to the guys at Balvenie and to David Stewart himself, they were never the same after 1401. When it went to 1509, it's not the same stock. It's not the same uh, depth of character or maturity of, of spirit. So these are these are things that once they're gone, they're gone forever. I will do. Uh, by the way, uh, Charlie, Shamini Charlie just said, let me know next time you're in Norway. I I assume she's talking to you. Uh, she could be messaging some guy from <laughs> Tinder and maybe got the wrong chat. But let Charlie know next time you're in Norway, and I think she might she might have something special for you. That came yeah, out I very did. wrong. I'm yeah, sorry, Charlie. That, that, that was you are you're bad. Tack så mycket. Jag jag ska se dig snart. Och vi vi dricker samman i kassan. Hey, Vistala, nej. Vistala nai svenska, vistala nai noise. I feel like I know. I know that was. I know some of that was Swedish. It was Swedish, but was. it was also it was it was strangely like a Yiddish Swedish. <laughs> you know, it sounded like. I when I first learned how to sorry when I learned how to speak Swedish like seven years ago and I've never used it since. I learned how to use, how to speak Southern Swedish, which I understand is the yokel. Uh, Redneck okay. Swedish. So <laughs> okay. I was I was actually asked at a because I, I, I could do an entire whiskey presentation in Swedish at one point in time. And I was asked by someone by a group of Swedish whiskey drinkers to not speak in the southern Swedish. So it's the only Swedish I know. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's polite. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But the very last question I want to ask you is, is there anything else you'd like to add? We've, we've covered so much. Um, no, I get, I, look, man, we, I, I, for me, we covered the important things. Don't be a dick. Don't spread negativity. I think there's, there's such a risk of that when we become connoisseurs because we visit distilleries and we're very fortunate. We never, we never really fully appreciate it. How transparent the big companies have been. They let us into their production facilities. They send out ambassadors to tell us the truth. Uh, if you ask someone or when I work for Balvenie, but if you ask someone who works in any distillery, do you use caramel? Do you use chill filtration? How long is your fermentation time? What kind of washback do you use? They answer honestly, that is fucking cool. There is no parallel in wine. I'm sorry, but you visit a winery in California or in Bordeaux, and they are not clear with you. You visit a cognac distillery, and they outright lie. We are so lucky that the whiskey community has grown out of Scotland. And I'm not saying it's the only place that um, makes whiskey traditionally or that should be in the future, but something about the Scottish people and the way they are with a balance of um, keeping each other in check by banter and never letting anyone take themselves too seriously um, is so healthy and uh, it permeates the whole culture that, that, that circulates around that amber and nectar that's in the glass. So I'd encourage all of us to remember that it's just a drink. Don't take yourself or your blog posts or your podcast or your whiskeys that you make too seriously. It's just a drink. It's about the people who enjoy it. Um, 
spread 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 the good vibes like i've seen all this shit this week about or la- a couple weeks ago about waterford all the shit this week about um the perfume bottle from uh McNeil. if you don't like it if your view if your world view is so binary that that pretty has to be feminine and macho is the only way whiskey should look then go 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 away you're in the way of innovation and progression i'm sorry i got what was wrong with the bottle of McNeil? I, I saw a few groups, including Malt Maniacs, uh, flag it as a uh, perfumey and feminine. As in the bottle, I, I thought the bottle looked fantastic. It's, it's gorgeous. It's, 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 it's an organic, sustainable distillery, and that's totally captured visually in the pack. I think it's gorgeous. Okay, I, my point is, it's my just, point is, whatever. Let, let, let's let's just spread positivity and love. And it's there's there's no uh, look at me, the old hippie after three Manhattans. Um, but that's, that, that, that's, that is what it's about. It's about sharing and enjoying. It's not about, uh, shaming or, or keeping people away. It's about inclusivity. So bring, bring more people in. Don't push them away. Sam is completely right. Spread positively, uh, spread positively, bring new people into whiskey. And most importantly, on your next whiskey order, purchase, uh, purchase yourself a bottle of Baines and a bottle of the world whiskey blend. Uh, very important you do the final two as well but that brings us on to the quiz questions and because it's you because it is sam i had to go all out and i had to really dig deep Fuck. and it occurred to me none of these questions involve old world countries all of these questions involve new world whiskey countries oh gosh okay i'm pretty sure you'll get three out of how many how many questions you're about to ask me oh it's five yeah, yeah. all right you'll, yeah. okay well i'll, I'll be happy you'll, with that. you'll that's score. a good score so our first question and for everyone who's watching now and watching in the future feel free to try and guess as well by all means what cold war whiskey is famous for its creation by vaclav sintna at the pradlo distillery near pilsen in the czech republic i need, I need you to ask that again what, what we're trying to get i'm sorry the, the distillery name or the product that they made this guy Prague. i want you to tell me that the product the product name i can tell you the distillery name uh was Pradlo distillery in the czech republic it was made during the cold war it was released after the cold war uh, um okay well the only the, the, it, it's it's an educated guess, but it's a guess. I'm going to say it's called Submarine. It's not called Submarine. All right. Um, yeah. Think, think Soviet. Think Soviet symbols. It's named after one of those Soviet symbols. Well, which would you rather drink, a hammer or a sickle? The first one. Would I? Okay. I, I want to get hammered on the hammer. It's against. I mean, that's probably against the Portman Group guidelines. But yeah, let's get hammered on hammer. So this is um, hammerhead whiskey. Oh fuck me, hammerhead. Okay. Have you tried nice. hammerhead before? I haven't actually. No. I really like hammerhead whiskey. Hammerhead whiskey was the creation of Vaclav Sitna, Um during the Cold War at Pradlo Distillery. Basically, the story kind of goes that they were told, you know, the call came from higher up, that they had to make a whiskey that could match the West. So they made a whiskey with Czech water, Czech barley, Czech oak, every, everything was around Czech. They, uh, they had to figure out how to distill whiskey first. And let. When it came time to bottle, the Berlin Wall had fallen, the Cold War was over. So the bottles, the casks, just kind of left there. This is at the time that Czech Republic is flooded with Tullamore Jew. So you've got Irish whiskey. It's cheap. It's Irish. Tullamore Jew is actually a really good whiskey. Everyone drinks that instead. So no one really thought about it until a London company purchased 
uh, the distillery in the, I think it was the early 2000s, and then found all these old barrels of Czech whiskey. Like, I think the youngest whiskey was 18 years old or something, and the oldest was about 23, 25. Yeah, 25. I remember a camera at 25 year old, yeah. You used to be able to go through um, duty freeze all through the UK, Europe, Ireland, and you would find these bottles of Hammerhead whiskey, a 23 year old bottle of Czech whiskey for 50 euro. And it was really nice. That was great whiskey. Where is it now? Can you f- still find it? Uh, you can still find it in some places. You can't find the very old stuff and you can't find the very young stuff. Find the middle ground stuff. 21 and the 23 are still available. I think Whiskey Exchange and Master Malt still have a couple of bottles and then, you know, small independent shops will still have some. But definitely, if you would like to try a very different whiskey, Hammerhead whiskey is fantastic. Cool. Fun facts. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right. Your second question. Which distillery recently released the world's northernmost whiskey? So, now, if you can you... tell me the country... Go ahead. Go ahead. If you can tell me the country or the distillery. Well, you, you, you gave a clue earlier that we're not really Scotland focused. So I'm no, going to say is... we, we already mentioned Norway. So I will say the Aurora distillery in Norway. Yeah. The Aurora distillery in Norway released the Bivros whiskey, which I understand the distillery is about five to 10 meters away from the Arctic Circle and has one of the coolest stories in the world. I, I love shit like that. Yeah. So, well, it's wait, sorry. What the... So it's a distillery what... that is, uh, that is based in a NATO call a cold war bunker that was made oh, right. yeah, by yeah. the Germans during occupation of world war two. That is straight away. If anyone said to me, do you want to have a whiskey that's made in this place? I'd be like, yeah, I don't care how much yep. it costs. I want to drink right that whiskey. <laughs> And awesome. Charlie got that in one as well. Charlie, Aurora Spirits. Yeah, the Live Ross Whiskey. All right. All right. Now, this is, is going to be an interesting question. In which country is the Athru Whiskey produced using all ingredients, stills, and wood from that country? at an old vineyard. I'll give you some clues to the country. The name of the native tree is cedar. The Phoenicians were the first, uh, who were the first people to build boats, were the residents of this country. Uh, In 1990, Elias Corey, a citizen of this country, received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. This country is in Asia. Athru. I thought Athru was um, an Irish whiskey. You, everything else no, you're saying. Sorry. You are completely correct in saying that. Uh, sorry. I. It is spelt. Let's see if I can spell it on here. Apparently I can't. It is spelt like a whiteboard right here a t h y r u that is well, the name of the whiskey i think okay you, you said cedar and what was the surname of the nobel winner the surname of the nobel winner was Corey. No, that's not clear at all. I mean, again, that drives me back to Ireland. Fucking hell. Well, um, oh, oh. this vineyard also produced, uh, I believe it's pronounced Rach Rashi.
Reiki. Reiki. Well, they also well, produce. Perfect. Okay, so then we, we've said cedar. I know that um, I've actually got. I, I I sent a bunch of money, uh, as much as we could afford as a family, to the tragedy in Beirut recently. I have a gorgeous uh, few bottles of Beiruti wine. Uh, sorry, of Lebanese wine that a colleague sent me. Uh, an old colleague sent me, and you said cedar, so I am going to guess Lebanon. Lebanon is correct. Afro is the sole whiskey distillery, uh, a sole legal whiskey distillery. I can say. How do you spell it again? In sorry, I can write it into the computer over here. It is fantastic Hi. stuff, by the way. But to all the people in Lebanon, um, you know, how it's go out to you, we hope that you're okay. If anyone wants to donate anything, be it money or charity auction, anything you can do for the people of Lebanon right now, please go ahead, do it. They need they need the help right now. All right. So you've gotten two out of three questions. Which means I'm going to get the next two wrong. I don't think you'll get this one wrong. Um, so, which country announced their first malt whiskey distillery with the Emashan uh, distillery in 2019? The distillery in is being Marshan. built by Pernod Ricard. Im Ashan. So we've already done Lebanon. Oh, thank you. It's meant to be an N at the end. I, I apologize. And they're going to make whiskey there. They are going to make malt whiskey there. I'll give you a clue and I'll say that their regulations will allow them to have two-year-old whiskey. It doesn't need to be three. I can tell you right now, Batiki Dave has got the correct answer. So he's answered it because he visited China not long ago. Um, I couldn't remember the name, um, but I think Pernod did announce creating distillery, and I remember the two-year-old thing becoming a part of it, which is kind of annoying, but whatever, let it be. Um, I'm going to say, I don't know, for some reason I'm feeling Mongolia, but I'm going to say China. China is correct. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, you got he texted, that. He just texted me the answer. Uh, hey, Siri, can you thank Dave for me, please? Oh, no, office. She always, she always wakes up when I talk to her. You unlock your iPhone first. <laughs> thank you. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, uh, China's first malt whiskey distillery will be the Emishan Distillery, which is being built and financed by Perno Ricard. Uh, I believe they're due to start producing in 2021 with their first two-year-old malt whiskey coming onto the market in 2023. I'm actually quite excited for that. I am, I'm, I'm keen to see that. I think that'd be yeah. cool. Hey, that's going to be awesome. All right. And your final quiz question. Which country released the world's first taro-based whiskey in 2018? Uh, so this was launched by the scientific research organization of that country. Taro is a root vegetable similar to potatoes. Yeah. We grew taro in a similar way to rice. The national drink of this country is kava. Charlie, I'll give you both a clue here. It's not Japan. Kava. Hmm. That's throwing me off. So obviously not bubbly wine, Kava. God damn. I just want to point out, Dave has got this again. Fucking nerd. He's got... <laughs> Dave, Dave's got nothing else to do but become the most qualified whiskey advocate in the world right now. That's his, that's his core job. So that's unfair. Oh. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. I just don't get paid for it. <laughs> well, no, so, <laughs> there's no better motivation than a paycheck. Uh, yes. Fucking hell. Well, taro, taro is sort of, yeah, Polynesian islands. I don't know. 
Yep. Yep. Uh, It's embarrassing. I can't even think of any. What the fuck is out there? I need to look at that atlas. Kids? Oh, they're not here. They left. I got the house to myself. What, where's, that's a, is that movie they watch, Moana? That's not the right part of the world, is it? Is that Hawaii or is that out there? It's like Samoa and stuff like no, that. No, no, no. That's, that's the right part of the world. That's the right part of the world? But I, I don't believe that's the right country um, i don't know i i i yeah, I, 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 I i'm embarrassed that I, I actually can't pull any of those archipelagoic islands to my mind okay, okay. Uh, come on you did, give me you, did a PhD in, you did a phd in english literature uh the author of treasure island lived and died here I don't know that, but that's that's a, that's a fascinating fact, anyway. So, um, what's the what's the uh, Darwin Island? Um, no, no, no. So, no, we are you, we are uh, we are we are talking Polynesian, like out 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 there. We are we? talking Polynesian. Dwayne the Rock Johnson is Samoan. Part. Say again. Part Samoan. Yeah, but you said earlier. Uh, now I think you're fucking with me. <laughs> so, because a second ago we were like Galapagos. No, all right. I'm. Let, 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 you, you seem to be. You, your your eyes lit up when I. Let you know what I, I should get this wrong so that you're right that I got three out of five. I am going to say New Zealand. No, I, I don't know why you said New Zealand. It is Samoan. I didn't hear you say Galapagos. I I heard you say Polynesian. I did no no I did say Samoa. I did say Samoa, but I said he because the rock the rock clue, but I thought you were fucking with me there. All right. No, 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 no. I'm drunk and paranoid. I am a kind hearted individual who only wants you to succeed at this game. I appreciate that. No, oops, Samoan. Okay, that's so Kava is what? That's made out of taro as well. Yeah, uh, no, ooh, no, I don't think, I don't know if kava is made out of taro. Taro is a root vegetable. I think yeah. it's quite, it's similar to sorghum. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and and it's sort yeah. of sweet potato, isn't it? It's sort of like, a, it's like those long potatoes. Yeah, kind of like that. So uh, Samoa, the Samoa, uh, oh God, the scientific research organization of Samoa first launched whiskey in 2018, stocking it in local places. They did a rebranding of it, and I believe they were still making it in 2019, but I've not been able to find any news. Uh, but it is Samoa's first whiskey and the world's first Samoan whiskey, the world and the world's first taro whiskey. Sorry. Um, if anyone who's watching this has a bottle, please contact us because me and Sam would and would be so eager to try that. That sounds super we, amazing. We might uh, even share some with Dave. Yeah, we might. Eve, I didn't want to say that. That's that's your department. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry. That ends the quiz section. I think for that last one, because you thought I was fucking with you, I think I can give you half a point for that. So we're going to call it 3.5. <laughs> That's too generous, but okay. I, you know, no, no. You, you're, doing, you're doing above average. I say that not knowing the average. I don't really remember. But yeah, you know. <laughs> well, look, I love, I love me a little rock. I love the Jumanji. I love the rock. And I know he's part Samoan. And still, yet you still got the question wrong. Right? No excuse, Again, I know. But the good news is he might be president one day. So that's what America needs. Uh, he's a Republican. I don't want to hear that right now. But he might be the kind of Republican that, the, that we all need. Anyway. No, that's, not a, that's not a thing. A capitalist Republican is not what the world needs. That's, that's oh, just, yeah, capitalism that's didn't work for China, did it? It hasn't worked for anyone. 
Well, are we getting into are we, are we, it works. Are we in the, the, it works on the stock market. We're not gonna get we're not gonna get into that. That's that's a different channel. That's some politics book, right? You can look him up. He doesn't exist yet. <laughs> I should start, start that. that channel next. I'll be your first and worst guest. You will be the first, worst, and only guest on that channel. <laughs> All right. So our next category is anagrams. Everyone has watched this show before one knows what it is. These last five questions, I give you an anagram of a whiskey. Am I allowed to write? Oh, yeah, of course you are. Yeah, I can't do an anagram visually. I like, 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 yeah, without writing. No, no, okay? no. You, you write. You write if you need to write. So everyone is watching uh, live and watching later. Again, please, if you know the answer, write in. We always have a theme. This theme is these are all whiskeys that Sam has had a hand in promoting, making, and selling. Cool, fun. Okay. Ugh. That right. maple syrup whiskey is fucking sticky, I got to tell you. It's making a whole mess over here. Your first anagram is snub trend. You like to snub a trend, don't you? You know, you're you're a guy that goes by his own. You know, you have your own style. You don't go for trends. You snub them. Yeah. So, what type of whiskey? I mean, honestly, it's, it's right in front of me. Snub a trend it's right. With? It's right in front of me. <laughs> it's right I'm, in front I, of you. <laughs> I, I'm looking. I'm looking at this piece of paper, and I'm looking around the room here, and. Uh, it just jumped out of me. So that's got to be Burnt Ends. Burnt Ends is correct. Uh, burnt Ends is an anagram of snub trends. Uh, yeah, that's what we're working with here. That's the kind of level we're on. I will point out, I'll point out that, the, that that was a last minute addition because I thought that you made the Darkness whiskey. And you mentioned earlier that you didn't. Well, no, I so do. I just I don't take I don't take a lot of pride in it. It's just it's just choosing. It's like boutique. I I don't make boutique. Boutique becomes itself. Like I, uh, that's not false modesty. If you find a good cask, it's sort of arrogant to take any responsibility for it. We find a good cask, we bottle it. Fair enough. I uh, I I got rid of the anagram for darkness I had, which was by the way, it was ask nerds. Oh, what? Darkness! That's got darkness written all over. No, I, I do make darkness. My name's on it, but all I was saying... Anyway, all right, fair. Okay. I, I hope it was good. I mean. for, the next, for the next bottle of darkness, you can use the anagram Ask Nerds to send me a bottle of something. Anything. I don't really care. It could be a water. I need, I need to drink water. Anyway, your next anagram is it's the newest Scottish distillery it's Glen Siri or Glen Sire, depending on your pronunciation. I would go, yeah, Siri, I think. Yeah. Glen, Glen Siri, it's the latest Scottish distillery. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to tell you right now, Mick from Still Surreal has got this immediately. You've got it. What? Green Isle. Green Isle. This is Green Isle whiskey. I could go for a Green Isle, actually, so I'll leave that handy. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. All right. So who now, got it? Is, uh, Nick got it. Yeah, okay. All right. No, but you're getting these damn quick smart. Uh, well, we, we do anadrams. We stole it from you, like you but we do, we do anadrams. Yeah, I do, yeah. I'm shocked. I have a eight-year-old daughter who, since she was six, and re really since she could read, she could do anadram anagrams in a second. It's so strange. Um, it's that sort of lateral thinking. I don't know what it is, but it's fucking cool. 
I just I just like anagrams. I think they're fun. Anyway, yeah. which whiskey is made by a nasality infected yodeler? Nasality. Now, uh, you continue to work on that. I'll just, I'll just say, Dave had just commented saying he decided not to play as he knows the section I'm working from. I just had a look he over it, and that's that's fair enough. Dave knows all these because I did ask Dave for a bit of help on this. But Dave, if you want to guess for any of them, feel free. Go ahead. I've disabled the ability for Sam to see the comments, so he can't see what you write. Unless I put it on the no. screen. This is a whiskey that I've been involved in. Oh, yes. You have been involved in this whiskey. I mean, Dave told me you'd been involved in this whiskey. If you've not, I'm going to be really disappointed. I tell Dave all sorts of bullshit. Just to make me... Feel credible. No, come on. Just going to fill up a bottle of water. I'm going to leave this. And you poor bastards have to watch me sort of struggle through nasals. I mean, I'll uh, I'll tell you right now. Dave has gotten it. I I respect that Dave knew exactly what it was. But that's not going to work at all. Your anagram is nasality yodeler. Why am I doing that? There's a perfect way for me to do this. God, there's a lot of vowels. I'm str yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, just write it out again. Maybe. Thanks for tuning in. You get to look at my bald forehead as I write words on a piece of paper. Is that the yodeler? You know, you know. Solid yodeler, yeah. Fuck me. God damn it. Uh, uh, Lightly, arrow light Lindsay. I a ten year old. I S L A Y T E F. Welcome back. Hope you got some water. Cause I nailed it, bitches. Yeah. That is arrow light Lindsay is the correct. That took me too long. That's arrow light Lindsay is an anagram of nasality yodeler. And era like ten and Isla ten year old. So I mean, the 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 name itself is already an anagram. Anagram. I uh, that's just that's shameful. I apologize to everyone. I had to sit through that. Good one. Okay. Don't worry at all. Now, this is a whiskey you were heavily involved with. Uh, I've written that too big, so I'm just going to rub that off. Heavily involved with, okay. And I tell you, this whiskey is downright enviable. <laughs> okay, Balvenie. <laughs> Balvenie is correct. <laughs> Balvenie is a anagram of enviable. Uh, it is to date my favorite whiskey anagram. 
I think that's a fantastic anagram. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, your final anagram. Now, I'll be honest with you. I always, I tend to do the final anagram is an anagram of your company, whatever, whoever the guest may be. With you, I found I couldn't make an anagram of that boutique whiskey company that was small enough to fit on here. And also, it was very obvious. So, I've not done that with you. I've gone somewhere else. Your final anagram is a cannibal cud. The anagram is a cannibal cud. All right, I gotta write it out. A cannibal. I see Canada. Duck. Canada. Canada. <laughs> Canadian club. Canadian club. You were a uh, you were a young boy and a teenager and a uh, and an adult in Canada. I'm sure you were formative in buying Canadian Club. I I was a purchaser. Yeah, guilty. I did, I, actually, I didn't really drink much before I came to Scotland, but it was definitely if you if you were out, yeah, ginger ale and whiskey would end up coming to you with Canadian Club in it. Well, I'll be honest. There was another reason that I had that. Uh, that I had Canadian Club as an anagram. Are you aware of their marketing scheme from the late 60s to the early 90s? I don't think so. What, what was the tagline or whatever? Now, this, is, this is something I think every whiskey nerd should know. From the late 60s to the early 90s, Canadian Club wanted to promote their whiskey as a whiskey for people with adventurous spirit. So they hid a case of their whiskey in 25 places around the world, ranging from a tower in Manhattan to at Mount Kilimanjaro to the North Pole to when, I think, where, where Nelson died to the Great Barrier Reef. Fucking hell. They keep 25 cases of Canadian club whiskey around the world. To date, I think about seven of them have not been found. Oh! All the people in the... Yeah. <laughs> right? That's the <laughs> best bit. That is the best bit. Because oh. they, they hit them in places, and then they published in, mag in magazines, they published clues to where you could find the whiskey. I didn't know that. Half of them were apparently found by accident. For anyone who is in the UK watching this, there is, we know that there is a case of Canadian Club that has never been reported to be found around Loch Ness. There is a hidden case of Canadian Club whiskey from the 60s around Loch Ness in Scotland. I believe at this point in time, if you find it, Canadian Club actually has a reward as well. So, you know, well, I know yeah. where I'm going next on my trip. You know, yeah. I, I know I'm going to go to Loch Ness for a little bit just to camp and to drink and to try and find a case of Canadian Club. And when you find it, bring it to John at uh, Drummer Drock at Hotel. He'll have ginger ale. He'll be ready to help you open those bottles. Oh, sorry, I just, I, I think I learned about that marketing thing about two months ago, and I think, I still think it is and will always be the most incredible thing in whiskey marketing. I think everyone should do it. Everyone I think we might steal should it. try and find these bottles. I might steal it for boutique rum. 
I love that idea. I, I wonder what I did. I had never heard of that. And I, I wonder, I mean, I don't think you could advertise spirits in Canada in my lifetime until, until I was of drinking age. I don't think it was allowed at all. And then I, I basically left Canada at, at that point. So um, I don't think we had that campaign in Canada because there was no really, there was no spirits advertising allowed on television and magazines. Oh, that is, very, that is super interesting. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. But don't you beer, kind beer of want to go to... Add beer, but no spirits. I mean, I, I desperately want to go search if, if COVID weren't a thing. And if I had any amount of money, I am very broke. Uh, if I had any amount of money in COVID was a thing, I would try and track down the last hitting cases. Of yeah. That what what a fucking legacy. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're fulfilling this campaign, this 40 year old marketing campaign. That's fucking cool. That's cool. I, I, I'm in. Let's go. Let's, uh, let's, yeah, let's put our masks on and go get it done. Ah. Uh, oh, my God. So, anyway, that's really why I put Canadian in Club in there because I just wanted to talk about that. I, but, you mean a cannibal cud? A cannibal cud, yes. Uh, so all in all, you got uh, 8.5 out of 10. That you are well above average. You've not done the best. I know for certain one person who's done better than you is... Uh... Don't say Doug McIver. No, 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 no. Uh, Billy. Billy from the Whiskey Exchange. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's much yeah. smarter than I am. Yeah, no, that's fine. Now, someone who may have done better than you, I'd have to watch the video. Dave. That's fine, too. May I'm... have. Yeah. No, Dave Dave knows all this stuff. Dave yeah. is the Whiskey Nerd, the Whiskey Santa. We love Dave. <laughs> yeah. The Whiskey Santa. Yeah, no, that, that, oh, I'm, God, I'm... Yes. To be in a very proud fourth position behind those two and Doug McIver. Hey, Hello. Sorry, Doug McIver's never been on this show. I know. I'm just I'm trying to be provocative. No, no, no. If if you could invite Doug McIver, if you could tell him to come on this show, that'd be fine. I'm sure he would. Of course, a Friday evening, some drinks, some trivia. He would love that. Are you actually? Have your kids actually called you? No, this is a, uh, a just, this is not a real phone. Oh, that's a toy. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look. That's the end of our program. Thank you so much for being here. I've been your host. Sorry, go Some ahead. Some whiskey bloke. Some whiskey bloke. That does, that does mark the end of the program. I was going to say. Sam has started playing with the child's toy he's found. So that does mark the end of the program. This has been uh, one of the longest Malts with Mates we've ever done. This has been over two hours long. Oh, this is going to take so long to format. Uh, but I absolutely love chatting with Sam. I think talking to Sam, learning all about him, where he's come from, all the history is amazing. What he's doing with head of whiskey at Master Malt, uh, at, sorry, at Adam Brands and Boutique is fucking fascinating. So, you know, I'm looking forward to the next World Whiskey Blend, to the next whiskey you guys put out. Um, Sam, anything you want to end on? No, th uh, thank you for that. And I, I love it too. I mean, I think staying connected um, – through the internet. I know it's been a crazy time for so many and a very challenging time for some friends and people I don't know as well. And uh, my wishes go out to them. We try to do everything we can to support in the ways that we know how. But one, one, one positive in all this madness is just capitalizing on this resource. It's been at our fingertips all this time, this connectivity that the world has um, through the internet. But let's keep it up. It makes makes this massive fucked up life feel a little more connected. So thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you for coming on. I feel I should point out as well, the very first guest I ever had has tuned in and Shilton has said it was absolute fun, guys. Have a great weekend all. Shilton, we love you. 
and uh, I cross talk about getting Shilton back on the channel sometimes. So yes, and P anyone watching who doesn't Shilton, you got to check out Shilton's uh, TikTok, his Instagram. I mean, he's, he's he makes me laugh out loud staring at my phone. It's fucking great. Anyway, COVID madness hit Shilton very <laughs> hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's interspersed with real sweetness, uh, images of his father and images of, of his home country. And um, oh, yeah. he's a wonderful guy, super knowledgeable about whiskey and uh, doesn't doesn't take himself, takes whiskey very seriously, but doesn't take himself very seriously. And that's that's the right mix. No, he's fantastic. But that is all from us here today at, uh, at Malts with Mates. So to Sam, thank you for coming on. We raise a glass to you. And to everyone who watched, we raise a glass to you as well. You know, uh, as Sam has said earlier, spread whiskey, don't be a dick, and just try and get new people involved with it. But cheers to all, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.